So we're down to part eight today, Sing to the Lord, part eight, and looking at the a tremendous song that is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 15 and also mentioned in another book of the Bible. Tell me what book and what chapter? Right. 15, that's right, easy. Exodus 15, Revelation 15, Song of Moses relates to Israel and the Song of the Lamb mentioned in Revelation 15 relates to the church. Now last week we looked at the temptation to commit idolatry in the church and much music fits into that temptation. The Apostle Paul writes about it over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning in verse 5. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. We're talking, Paul is using as an illustration the Exodus wanderings through the wilderness. And he says, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Fascinating, because the Apostle Paul makes it very clear it was Jesus who was leading them through the wilderness wanderings. And they were putting Christ to the test. Not just God, general vague terms, but they were putting the Lord Jesus to the test. He says so right there. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. Here's the second time that he's told us that. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Why do we have all that stuff about the Exodus in the Old Testament, which he's just been talking about? Why do we have the Song of Moses in the Old Testament? Because it is an example for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then, a verse that I have sort of camped out on all my life ever since I was a young teenager, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And you can learn about all those temptations by studying the Exodus, because that's what he's just gone through for us. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, we don't always like the ways of escape that God gives to us, but he does make a way of escape. Every temptation that comes along, it's never too strong for you. It's a common temptation, and you're able to bear it because God the Holy Spirit dwells in you if you're a believer, and God always makes a way of escape when the pressure might get too strong. There is a way of escape, but you've got to take the way of escape. You're held accountable for it. If you don't take the way of escape, you can't blame God. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame somebody else because you are responsible before God, according to this passage, for taking the way of escape when God provides it. You have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. You have to say, I'm walking out of here. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to follow that path any farther. That's the end. That's the door. I walk the other way because God has called me to repent. And you do it. You know what it is in your life. I don't know what it is in your life, but you know what it is. You know what you need to make right with God. It's not too strong for you. If you're a believer, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will give you the strength to go, and he makes the door to go. And then he closes with verse 14. It's the same as verse 7 said, Neither be you idolaters. Now he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. What's the point of verses 7 and 14? It is... A believer can be an idolater. We asked the question last week, why would a believer want to be an idolater? The reason, because idols give pleasure. Idols give satisfaction. Idols are fun. Idols help you fit in with the crowd. Sure, I'll have another beer. Idols are the drug that makes you think you're okay because after all, you think that you are trying to worship God as you worship your idol. But best of all, idols provide only the very lowest moral, mental, emotional, and spiritual standards. They're at the very bottom. You don't have to do much when you worship the idol. Idols never require real sacrifice from you. Idols very quickly control the motives, desires, attitudes, thoughts, words, and actions of the idolaters. You know, if idols were no fun, there would be no idolaters. 
but because the idols satisfy the flesh, idolaters never want to give up their idols. And carnal Christians worship many different idols, one of which is their music. We gave you a lot of examples last week. There are multiple types of idols that correspond to the seven deadly sins. By the way, I gave you three different budaks last week, three budaks as to how to remember the seven deadly sins. Who can give me one of those budaks? Glass peg. Glass peg. That's the first one. What was the second one? Gap legs. Gap legs. And then I heard the third one a second ago. Egg slap. That's right. If you can remember any one of those three, you can remember the seven deadly sins because each one of those in egg slap, E-G-G-S-L-A-P, you have the first letter of one of the seven deadly sins. Same thing with gap legs. You know, behold what manner of men are these that wear their legs in parentheses. (laughs) That's the gap legs. And then glass peg, G-L-A-S-P-E-G. Each one of those letters will help you to remember the seven deadly sins. Greed, lust, pride, gluttony, anger, envy, and sloth. And we saw how they correspond to different gods that Christians have in their lives. The sin of greed, money. The deadly sin of lust, sex. The deadly sin of pride, power. The deadly sin of gluttony, food, whose god is their belly, who mind earthly things. The deadly sin of anger or wrath, position. The deadly sin of envy, possessions. The deadly sin of sloth. Let's be late to church again. The easy life. Folks, a lot of Christians have false gods. You've got to be very careful about the false gods, and music is one of them. That's the false god of pagan music dressed up in Christian clothing using Christian words that deceive the simpletons into worshiping a false god because the music itself glorifies the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. But remember, the vessel as well as the content must be holy to be used by the master. As clearly stated in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now listen to verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The vessel has to be holy that is carrying that which is holy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, and he's listed various sins, he shall be a vessel unto honor. You are supposed to be a clean vessel, sanctified and meet, that is, fitted out for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You don't use a spittoon to serve the Thanksgiving turkey. The vessel that carries the word of God in music must be a holy vessel. It is not pagan music dressed in Christian clothing. We looked at the text in Exodus chapter 32 where Moses comes down from the mountain and he hears all this noise in the camp and Joshua says, uh, it looks like there's a noise of war in the camp and and Moses said, that's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise, the noise of them that sing, I do hear. To Joshua, it sounded like chaos of war. Tells you something about the kind of music they were singing. Loud, raucous noise. Man, it sounds like a war is going on in the camp. Moses says, no, they're singing. When you think about contemporary Christian music, the guys up on the stage wiggling around, strobe lights and strumming guitars, what do you think? Well, anyway, they thought they were singing to Jehovah, but they had a false god. They had the golden calf. In other words, you can think you're singing to the God of the Bible, but you can actually be singing to a false god. And, of course, you know, Moses came down, broke the calf, ground it up, made, threw it in the water, made him drink the water, uh, burned it with fire. I mean, and then he challenged Aaron, "Is what in the world did the people do to you? And Aaron makes up these crummy excuses. But, you know, this, like all sins, all sins is a repetitive sin. Moses called on the Levite to kill all the false worshipers, but you know, it happened again in the history of Israel. You know, when when we see what God, through Moses, told the Levites to do, and they killed thousands of Jews, 
it should make us understand what God thinks about false worshipers and the penalty that they should receive. So be very careful with your music. Repetitive sin. We saw that it happened again over in 1 Kings 12, the days of Jeroboam. Jeroboam made golden calves at Bethel and Dan so that the people wouldn't go up to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel. And the people did. They decided to go to the golden calves. It's a lot easier. It's a lot closer. It's a lot more convenient. It's a lot more fun. You don't have to make such big sacrifices. You can go to something local and you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem, although Jehovah had said that they had to. Hey, we live farther away than those guys down in Judah. Why should we have to make a big long trip to get down there? Folks, because God said so. And that's all that's needed. When God sets standards, it doesn't matter how inconvenient it is for you. What matters is obedience to the word of God. Eighth, music and holiness. We've touched briefly on that, but I want to say a little bit more. We talked about how music must be holy because the principal purpose for which God designed music is worship. Did you get that? The principal purpose for which God designed music, God's a musical being. We saw that in Zephaniah. The principal purpose he designed it is worship. Therefore, the required character of Christian music must be holiness. Holiness is relates to separation. A saint is a hagios, uh, one who is set apart. That which is holy is that which is set apart for God alone. It's not a cheap imitation. It's an original. We don't have to duplicate the defective styles of the world, which were designed to give glory to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're worshiping the holy, living God, who is both the creator and the judge of all the earth. So you'd better make sure that your worship is holy. That means that you'd better make sure that your music is holy holy not just borderline about four weeks ago we started looking at the requirement of doing all for the glory of god and applying it to music the glory of god doing all for the glory of god does apply to music all of creation was made by the creator to bring him praise and honor and glory and someday god is prophetically guaranteed that it will we saw that in revelation chapter 4 whatsoever you do do all to the glory of god We talked about how it's important to examine everything to make sure it is to the glory of God. And we read Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those, speaking of the Bereans, than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, who were they checking out and comparing against the Bible? Who was it? Who were they putting to the test of the Bible? Paul! If the Bereans can put Paul to the test, you can certainly put me to the test of the Bible. But that means if you're not going to be two standards, you've got to put your music to the test of the Bible too. Rather important. You love to put me to the test. Man, I wish we could find Pastor Spencer wrong. Then we don't have to listen to what he says. Put your music to the test. There's a seven-point checklist I gave you once before. It Check out everything, that includes your music, against Scripture to see if it denies, ignores, or compromises Scripture in seven practical areas. Number one, first area, separation from all that is evil. That's the bottom line right there, separation from all that is evil. Number two, carnality, that is the stimulation of the flesh. Does your music pass that test? Number three, compromise. Giving up doctrinal or moral purity just to get along with everybody else. That's what compromise is all about. Giving up doctrinal or moral purity just to get along with everybody else. Fourth test for your music, worldliness. Does it promote a temporal world view? Number five, you know the next three. The lust of the flesh, does it promote sex? Lust of the eyes, does it promote greed? Pride of life power control, playing God. Oh, people love that one. I also asked the question last week, will this cause someone else to stumble? You have to check everything in your life by that. Everything, including your music. Will it cause someone else to stumble? What are the requirements for being an example? You have at least three areas where you have to be an example. Number one, an example to other believers. Is it going to cause another believer to stumble? 
is going to cause another believer to stumble. Number two, you have to be an example to children. Is this going to cause a child to stumble? What I insist on my right, is it causing a child to stumble? What I enjoy so much, is it causing a child to stumble? What I want to insist on, nobody can take away from me. Am I causing a child to stumble? Jesus said, if you offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it was better for you to have a millstone. I've seen some of them in Israel. Humongous, big, thick stones. They're standing this time. They put them up on edge so you can see them. And you see the slanted lines where they ground the grain, the hole in the center. I used to buy flour every year over in Lancaster County. Back when we lived up in North Jersey, we bought a thousand pounds of stone ground flour every year. Went to a mill run by an old man who's now with the Lord named Christian Landis. I don't think his mill is in operation anymore, but he had a stone mill that he still used a big stone. That thing weighed tons. Jesus said, better to have one of those things tied around your neck and thrown into the depth of the sea. That's a better way for you to end than to cause a child to stumble. What's your music doing? Or anything else in your life? And number three, your example, to the unregenerate world that's looking for opportunities to criticize Christ. Do they see a difference in you? <clears throat> or do you listen to the same music that they listen to that they say, yeah, this really mm, stimulates my flesh? If it's questionable, don't do it. Everything must be positively for the glory of God. <clears throat> we asked the question some weeks ago, who are your heroes? You tend to be like the heroes because you copy them. Your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, they're going to be copying you. What are they going to copy? Well, my motives are right. Well, actions don't whitewash motives. Correct actions without correct motives are always wrong. Now, let me give you some new illustrations today. Concerning how some music, you can have a composer who writes both good music and bad music. You can have a composer who writes music that follows biblical principles. And we've given you, at this point, ten different biblical principles. We've reviewed eight of them this morning. He can write good music. He can write bad music. He can write music that follows biblical principles. He can write music that is designed to produce sinful responses. So I want to give you a classical composer like that. The music of Franz Schubert is, for the most part, good. For example, I love his Di Forella, the trout. Um, it, it describes a, one of the beautiful creatures of God's creation swimming up the river. Uh, excellent, beautiful music. It does bring glory to God because it describes accurately what God has done. But you know, Franz Schubert wrote some other music some of his music is good. It follows biblical principles of music, harmonic structure, melodic lines, subservient rhythm developed earlier during the Protestant Reformation. However, there's at least one piece that he wrote that's dangerous because it very skillfully describes debauchery without inserting a warning. And I'll explain the warning business in a minute. Schubert wrote a seductive piece of music called Lust Lyre, also known as the Devil's Pleasure Palace. What Schubert failed to take into account was the absolute guaranteed divine truth of the law of harvest in Galatians 6 that says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And you know something? Schubert learned that lesson the hard way. He was able to powerfully, seductively portray in music the debauchery of the worst moral decadence. And he even in the title gave credit for the stimulation of the flesh to the devil who provided such pleasures, physical pleasures, to those who yield to the flesh. And indeed, Schubert enjoyed the pleasures of sin for a season and died of syphilis at age 28. What a wasted life. 28. What could he have done 
if he hadn't yielded his music to the flesh. God gave him incredible gifts and the incredible ability to follow biblical musical principles, but he allowed sensual pleasure to rot his talent, his soul, and his body. The wages of sin is death. Let me give you another illustration. Another gifted, also died young musician was Mozart, who lived from 1756 to 1791. He died at the age of 35. He was a brilliant child prodigy, along with his almost as brilliant sister, and began touring shortly after his fourth birthday, playing concerts for European royalty. Can you remember back when you were four years old? Can you imagine playing concerts for royalty at age four? <laughs> Mozart was a rather gifted little boy, and his sister was almost as good as he was. Throughout his life, he was a staunch Roman Catholic, though he followed and developed musical structures developed by the great Reformation musicians. You know, you, you don't realize what an incredible heritage you have in the Reformation. God brought music to its flourishing peak during the Reformation. And men like Johann Sebastian Bach developed from the Reformation principles, they developed musical principles that have lasted for us today and it's infect, affected all other music to some extent or another. Even the Roman Catholics followed those principles developed by Bach and others. But oddly enough, somewhere along the way, did you know that Mozart became enamored with and then strongly influenced by Freemasonry? Yeah, Freemasonry, the Masons, the Masonic Lodge. His opera, The Magic Flute, which was first performed at Vienna in September 30, 1791, is closely related to Masonic ritual. There is much Masonic symbolism in both the libretto and the score. Mozart also lived an immoral life and died at 1 o'clock in the morning on December 5, 1791, the cause of his death being uncertain. Now, let me give you an illustration of music written by another Roman Catholic that not only built upon the foundation of musical principles established by the Protestant Reformation, but greatly expanded and developed those principles. Giuseppe Verde, 1813 to 1901, lived a long life. He died at the age of 88. He hated the priests. He saw how rotten and how corrupt they were, and he wrote about that. He hated the priests, he, but he always remained a Catholic. But a number of his works follow biblical themes. For example, his opera Nabucco, the biblical story of Nebuchadnezzar. Verdi had recently lost his wife and infant son and was in deep depression. But he read the libretto to Nabucco, the words that had been written out. They wanted him to write the music. He said, I can't do it, but I'll read the libretto. When he came to the chorus of the Jews in captivity, he was suddenly released from his despondence and he wrote the music. And it's powerful. Nabucco was first performed in 1842 and established his fame in Italy. But perhaps the most powerful church music, uh, powerful music that he wrote was his church music and that was in his Requiem. Among all the standard sections for a Requiem, his Dies Irae, that means Day of Wrath, stands among some of the most powerful music written on the theme of the judgment of God upon sinners. When you hear that, you shake. The thunder of God's wrath from heaven splits the auditorium. The wail of sinners being slammed forcefully into hell pierces the darkness as the lightning flashes and the earth trembles. The holiness of Christ sears the soul as you think about your own sin. The Dies moves me to tears every time I hear it as I picture the lost being cast into hell by the holy righteous God of the universe and know that but for the grace of God that's where I would be. It does what music is supposed to do. It brings glory to God alone. The music fits the words and it fits them powerfully. Pagans and unbelievers can write music that brings glory to God when it follows the principles that we've been outlining in all these lessons over the last eight weeks. 
too much so-called contemporary Christian music tries to frame glorious biblical themes and words into the most trivial, frivolous, petty, uncreated, unskilled, and dull repetitive music. That's blasphemous, folks. And yet they think because they got Christian words, they can use that kind of trivial, frivolous, petty, uncreative, unskilled, dull, repetitive music. The problem is the music trivializes the message and makes it unimportant. And believers laugh and yawn. To treat the powerful grand words and themes of scripture this way is sin. Say, well, I still don't get it. Okay, let me give you a parallel so you will be able to understand how even an unsaved pagan composer can write music that follows biblical principles and a truly saved Christian composer can write junk. Think for a moment in terms of athletics. Does the Bible say we're supposed to take care of our bodies? Yes. Does it give prohibitions against gluttony and sloth? Yes. Does it tell us not to defile the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body? And does it tell you that if you do, God will destroy you? Yes. Now, physical athletics is a good, though not the highest. When compared with spiritual things, it's good, but it's not the best. You don't ignore it, but the spiritual things are far more important. But you know, just like an unsaved man can follow biblical principles and disciplines that are essential to sound music, even so an unsaved athlete can follow the correct regimen for developing his physical body, for keeping it fit, and maximizing all of his skills and abilities. In contrast, an otherwise godly Christian can be an obese glutton and a sloth. You see, when pagans follow biblical principles, they get good results. A lot of Christians think, well, it doesn't matter. I'm only interested in the spiritual things, so I won't care about my body. I'll just eat and drink everything that I want. You defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. So the same thing is true when it comes to music. A pagan who follows biblical principles can produce great music. He can actually produce music that he doesn't realize is bringing glory to God, even though he's just sort of wandering through it and, you know, trying to earn himself a living. There are some who understand the principle and use their music to bring glory to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We talked about Richard Wagner, who hated Christ, who hated the Jews, who was a follower of Darwinian principles. And Hitler loved Wagner because Wagner understood this and he expressly put his worldview into his music, and that's why I don't listen to the music of Richard Wagner. Well, anyway, back to that. When we do all to the glory of God, that's an objective standard, not a subjective standard, because God doesn't give subjective standards. With God, everything is either light or darkness, black or white. There are no shades of gray with God. Either something is sin or it is righteous. That is one of the main themes of 1 John. That means that he has an objective standard for elements of worship, including music and that brought us to the ninth principle which i just will mention quickly i uh, hope you remember because it's essential to the music question music and strange fire god never permits elements of strange fire in that which he uses in his worship he will not permit strange fire on his altar the center of his worship music is central to worship we saw what happened to nadab and abihu the sons of aaron when they offered strange fire before the lord in leviticus 10 1 through 7 god killed them and I wonder how much strange fire music would be played by worship bands today if God still killed people for offering strange fire. Now, we've already covered a few new things today, but I want to pick up where we left off last week when we're talking about music. We fall under the exclusionary category of doing all to the glory of God. One of the big areas is motives. We all know people who perform their music for their own glory, for making money, for trying to get rich, for reasons of pride, trying to get other people to think that they are super cool and all that. But whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. That command determines our level of love to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father as we seek to love Him fully, doing all for His glory. It drives us to seek out the areas where our love is weak or non-existent. It compels us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It causes us to examine ourselves with relentless and unstoppable honesty as we seek to eradicate sin from our lives. It determines not only the external appearances of life, but our internal motives. How many good things we do for the wrong reasons. 
We fail to understand that no matter how good our external actions, if our motives are wrong, our actions are not for the glory of God. How often our motives become the ship lost in the storm of selfish, carnal, covetous, proud, slothful, lustful, angry, envious, gluttonous, personal focus. It's all about me kind of stuff. Motives tangled in the swamp of slimy personal interest regardless of the will of God. How often has an apparently impeccable life which looks like it's being lived for the glory of God been wrecked on the rocks of wrong motives? Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That means there are no areas that are private. There are no R&R &R areas where you can kick off your shoes and let down your guard and sloth about. There are no areas where you can be loose and slack and let boys be boys. There are no jobs where you can say it's good enough for government work. There are no areas that are off limits. There are no closets where you can stash secret sins or personal pets. There is no corner that God may not enter. There are no neutral zones. There are no places where you can put a do not enter sign directed at God. There is never an area that can be declared no man's land. There are no boundaries where you can say stop, verboten. Doing things for the glory of God does not apply here. Do all for the glory of God. That's serious business. I think a lot of us don't take God seriously when we hear those words, and I think a lot of us are going to be rattled out of our booties when we stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. Now some new stuff. Music and junk. Don't give God your junk. Don't give God your junk. Give him your best. Now somebody else may have something better, but he doesn't require that from you. He only requires your best. If somebody else gave it, it might be junk because they could have given something better. God doesn't expect the same thing from little children that an orchestral violinist could give. God only requires your best. He does expect something, though. In other words, he expects you to give something related to your musical gifts and not to use the excuse that there are other people who do better. That means you should be here and be on time when the musical portion of the worship service is in progress and not be late so that you can skip that part of the worship. Let's talk about giving to God in junk for a second. I want to give you two illustrations, one from the Old Testament crippled lambs and one from the New Testament widow's mite. Actually, the two mites. We cut her short when we say the widow's mite. She actually gave two mites. But over in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts? O priests that despise my name, and ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? And now he explains it. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And how do they do that? You offer the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? In other words, they were giving God their junk. They were saving the best stuff for themselves and giving God the blind ones and giving God the lame ones. And after all, they're going to kill it, so it doesn't matter. It's blind, blind. God says, you're giving me your junk. Try to give something like that to the governor and see how he'll like it. You wouldn't dare do that. You have more honor for a human being than you have for me, the Lord of hosts. You know, I had a guy in one of the churches that I served many years ago that always gave his broken stuff to the church when he got new stuff for himself. <laughs> Ever been there? He did it so that he could get a tax receipt. <laughs> Don't give God your junk, especially when you are trying to use it for your own benefit. Make sure that you do it with the right heart. Just giving sort of good stuff is not enough. Micah chapter 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What does God really want? Verse 8. The motto of the Christian Legal Society. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with thy God. You know, Jesus also had something to say about giving your best. And by the way, note the context of Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 38, but note the context of verse 40. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplace. That's, that's their motives. And the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses. Now that's verse 40. Because we're going to see the widow at the end of this passage. To them, that wasn't much money. It says they devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a poor widow and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. What was principle 10? Music and junk. Don't give God your junk. Give him your best. Give him with all your heart because you love him. You may not be as great as some singer like Placido Domingo or, you know, some pianist like Lang Lang or some great violinist like Yitzhak Perelman. But you can give him your best. When it comes to music, that's true. Now, we come to one of the most important sections that really needs to be understood. 11. This is the 11th point. Music and language. Music and language. What is the music saying across cultures? It's very important. What is the music saying across cultures? Let me get down some practical application. You know, we talked about offering strange fire to the Lord. Let's apply that principle to music by asking some very pointed questions. Because remember, I know you've heard this. Now plug it in. Music is a universal language. Music is a universal language. It transcends culture and it communicates something about the culture and the context in which the music was developed. It communicates something about the culture in which the music was developed. So to test the music, let me ask some questions. Number one, how was this particular music originally used in the culture where it originated? Let's go back to roots. How was this particular music originally used in the culture where it originated? Question two. Did those who developed these forms of music use them to glorify God or to worship demons? That's number two. Did those who developed these forms of music use them to glorify God or to worship demons? In other words, is this form of music strange fire? Number three. Even if this particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom? Even if this particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom? Did you know that there are over 300 distinct forms and many subforms of genre of music that are clearly defined and that have specific elements that set them apart. More than 300, I actually made a list of them once. I couldn't find it. I would have, you know, read them all to you, but you wouldn't have liked it, so that's why God didn't let me find it, I think. But anyway, that set them apart from other forms of music. For example, just this past week, I heard some Eritrean music on the radio the other day, and folks, it is really weird. You know, as you listen to it, and I'm glad they didn't play much of it, they were just giving it as a sample, it scrambles your insides. It makes you feel like you're going to have a heart attack. 
Eritrea is a province on the Red Sea in a federation with Ethiopia, has an odd mix of Islam and Coptic Christians. It was dominated by the Italians during World War II, became the launching point for Italian dominance over Ethiopia. Political and religious backgrounds there have made an incredible impact on that music, and they've had a major impact on music in history. So, question four, how do you know what you can use and what is dangerous to use, keeping in mind that we have to do all for the glory of God, not just be neutral? For example, let me give you another example here. It's well known that Roman Catholicism has penetrated many ancient cultures and taken up their idols, then taken those idols and dressed them up in robes and rechristened them with the name of Mary. I've seen some of this. In Mexico, there are many local towns where they have an annual festival, just like they used to do with the same pagan gods, with the same statue, which they carry through the streets. Now it's dressed up like Mary. I saw one of those when I was down in Mexico. And it was a pagan statue that had been dressed up like Mary. I think we would all agree that that's strange fire practice. So tell me. What's the difference between taking pagan musical forms that were originally designed to worship the devil and rechristening them with, quote, Christian words? You know, rock music and all its forms goes back to the demon worship of pagan tribes in Africa, the Far East, and South America. That's the roots of rock music. Remember what 1 Corinthians 14, 7 and 8 said? Even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So this is music even without words here. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? The great music of the Protestant Reformation has transformative power over such evil music that sprang from demon-worshipping tribes. That theology and the great Reformation musicians and those who sprang from them, such as Bach and Handel, who sprang out of the Reformation history, affected generations of later musicians and creatively established the highest forms of Baroque musical structure upon which Rococo classical romantic musical period musicians built. Let me give you an illustration. When I lived in Israel, one of my teachers was named Jim Monson. He and his wife, Polly, and their children had served as missionaries in what was at one time the Belgian Congo. His delight and why he had come to Israel was to bring Africans to Israel to see that what the Bible said was true and that the stories actually happened in a literal land and that the descendants of the Bible nations were still there. Because the Africans, of course, had grown up with traditional stories that they knew weren't true, but they passed them on from generation to generation. So for Jim to show them that the Bible was literally true was an immense, intense pleasure. Jim was also a lover of great music. In fact, there in Israel, he actually had a pipe organ built into his house. He had cut a hole in the ceiling of the living room first floor up into the second floor because he had these long pipes. He had a full-size pipe organ so they could stick up through the ceiling into the second floor. Now, I know it's politically incorrect to say this, but for years, Jim and Polly faced the power of demon music in Africa, especially as used in the incantations of the witch doctors. After many years of labor, Jim led a few of the tribal natives to Christ. One of the very first things that they did was begin to teach the converts to sing the music of Bach in part harmony. Can you imagine that? I said, but they're just natives. Music is an international language. It transcends cultures. And it has powerful effects. He began to sing or teach the tribal natives to sing the music of Bach in part harmony. You know, the new believers were thrilled. Soon that great music was sweeping through the tribes and many more came to Christ as the power of godly music crushed the demon music of the witch doctors. Let me give you another illustration. I see our time is running out, but I'll give you this illustration. In one of his cantatas, Bach describes the fall of Satan from heaven in the words of Jesus. And you know something? He does not use a tune like, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. He doesn't use some trivial thing like that to describe the fall of Satan from heaven. 
Instead, he uses a great, crashing, jagged thunderbolt of music in the bass, beginning high and descending rapidly in jagged movements up and down, all the way down. He's describing the fall of Satan from heaven, and he's describing it musically. The music fits and describes the words about Satan's fall. It describes them with power. In Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, every time the words of Christ are being sung, there's a halo of light of high violins in A major surrounding the words. Every time the words of Jesus are being sung, it's a motif that tells you this is the words of Jesus. The high halo of violins in A major. Oh, people, I have forgotten so much that my mother and father taught me when I was a child. They were incredible musicians. They understood the power of music. Bach was one of the first to study the effects of different keys in music on the human mind and the body. He discovered that the key of A major is the key that best describes light. C major is the most powerful to describe what might be called pomp and circumstance. F major gives the feel of the military and is often used in marches. As Bach used these discoveries with power to write music that described the words of the biblical text most clearly, he did it for the glory of God. And he wrote that often on his music. To the glory of God, or Jesus, help me. In the margins of the music of the original manuscripts, you find him writing that. His purpose and his skill was used to bring glory to God. You don't find that in contemporary Christian music, so-called. And so what does it mean to do all to the glory of God? How do we approach the question when it covers all of life, including music? What's the first handle we can grab onto? And we'll look at that next week as we begin with Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that you are the true and living God. And you've designed music to bring you glory. It's central to your worship. And you will not accept strange fire on your altar. Help us to learn to be discerning. Help us not to give you our junk, but to give you our best, even though it may be small. Father, take your word as preached today. Use it to the conviction of sin, to the blessing of our hearts, as we thank you for being the gracious and glorious God, as we sing your praises, and as we go forth to witness for Jesus Christ. Make us faithful, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.